Joining us this hour in Los Angeles, trial attorney Wendy Patrick and criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor David Bruno, who's in New Jersey. Welcome to both of you for all of your expertise this hour. Let me start with you, David. Talk about the intent and how the state can prove that this defendant meant to drive into all of these people and kill them when he has said during one of the hearings through his attorneys, I didn't mean to kill anybody. Sure, I mean, that, that statement that the defendant made is certainly a self-serving statement. And uh, we'll see if, if the prosecutor even wants to use that at trial. Because it's self-serving, I, I, as the prosecutor, wouldn't admit it. I would let the defendant try to admit that and take the stand. But as far as intent, um, just look at common sense here. I mean, this is, there's really no other explanation for this other than maybe an insanity or some mental issue at the time. Whenever somebody is using that vehicle and look at that footage and listen to that testimony today, chilling testimony coming from that courtroom, and this is only the start of this case. That was a preliminary hearing. That was, a, that was for purposes of detention. And look, uh, I, I as a prosecutor would also uh, lodge the murder intentional uh, crime to be considered by the jury. Really for the prosecutor, there's no, there's no loss on it. I mean, they originally called it recklessness. They were able to get those charges. And then after they review, reviewed the totality of the circumstances, looking at all the video, hearing from all the eyewitnesses, when somebody is bringing their vehicle down a street like that with pedestrians the way that he did, I don't see any other explanation as to what was in his mind other than potentially some insanity, him not understanding it, but really, that's just a hypothetical and assumption at this point because I have not heard any mental uh, testimony to go towards that defense. Right. That's why I'm left with the belief that there's no other explanation but for intentional act. And I will say, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I will say that the family has said he has mental health issues, but there's been no suggestion by the defense at this moment anyways of a mental health defense, meaning insanity, didn't know right from wrong at the time. Wendy Patrick, I think I'm going to cheat a little because I want to talk to you a little bit about the psychology of it. And okay, so he has said, I didn't mean to kill anyone when I drove into this parade. But what, what could the motive be? Of course, that's not an element to the crime, but it's an important thing for a jury to understand. Actually, that's so well said. It's, it's exactly right. We don't have to prove motive to prove murder, but motive matters to the jury. So we look at the actions themselves. Now, vehicles are deadly weapons, and anyone with a license can drive one. There's no background checks. There's no waiting period to buy or rent a car. There's no prohibited persons list. Everybody knows this, and we've seen enough cars driving into crowds of people throughout the years and the carnage and just the, the massacre that that causes, that it would almost belie logic to suggest that this man didn't know that. That's sometimes the easiest way to prove the intent behind actions is how could you not know exactly what you were risking? Now, it would be different if we had a less populated area, uh, not so densely packed, but a Christmas parade where people are gathered specifically for the purpose of enjoying a, a holiday together, that's gonna be a, a very hard pill for a jury to swallow. Now, the fact that you haven't heard a mental element, a mental defense so far, doesn't necessarily mean, and all three of us know this, that we won't. That may be the next thing we learn as this case marches on to trial as a result of being bound over at this prelim. Right, absolutely agree with you. And you know, a couple of things to note. Number one, he was going over 25 miles an hour. Number two, I remember when I first saw this video being played on networks and I couldn't, I couldn't hear sound, I was just watching and I immediately thought, oh my gosh, this person has had a stroke or had something health-wise happen to them that, that while they were driving. And as a result, their car is not being controlled by them. They're not conscious. But no, it wasn't that scenario at all. David, let's talk about legalities a little bit because if you're not as familiar with the criminal justice system, you may hear, okay, well, he had a preliminary hearing for purpose of detention this morning. How is that different from trial? So tell us all, if you would, about the difference and why you have a preliminary hearing in our criminal justice system. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, everyone's been hearing about these modifications in, in bail and bail reform and things like that. 
And there are states that have moved away from monetary bail and the right to detain. And detention should only be for the most serious cases where defendant is a flight risk, where the, the public is at risk, or there could be some destruction of evidence. So courts have these very early determinations whether or not to release or detain. And if somebody like this individual is detained with this type of bail, well, there's, there's the statutes allow for a preliminary hearing. Why? Because if, if they're being detained with this bail, look, it's $5 million. Well, we want some uh, evidence that's presented that to, to show that there's been probable cause, that there's a prima facie case, so that we're not holding people uh, illegally or without the evidence being shown here. So he could have waived this. He did not. I wouldn't have waived it if I was the defense attorney. The defense attorney got their crack at a witness or two through some cross-examination. And we heard that in the lead up to this point, trying to get out that there was a self-serving statement, trying to get out some of the evidence that would lean towards mitigation. The preliminary hearing is there if a defendant is detained to make sure that there's a prima facie or a probable cause to detain. And that is the reason here. And there's no rules of evidence too. You heard the, poli the police officer or the witness testifying about hearsay. That would not have happened at the real trial. They would be objectionable as to testifying to what earth. the preliminary hearing did not follow the same rules that a final uh, trial in front of a jury would. So this is a very preliminary decision, a low level. There's also a different standard here. It was probable cause versus what we see in the jury trials, which is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So this is a component of bail reform when you're detaining individuals. There are states that allow for preliminary hearings and this state is one of them, and we just saw it today in open court. And Wendy, to David's point, he just pointed out the $5 million bond, and this gentleman is facing 77 counts, including the deaths of six individuals. What do you think when you hear all those big numbers? Well, they're, they're adding up everybody that was injured. Sometimes big numbers uh, sound worse than they are, but I don't think that's the case here because remember that represents the victims. You know, one of the things actually that uh, factors in to bail is not only the degree of callousness, recklessness, but what kind of carnage, what kind of injuries and damage did somebody cause? And so here the charging reflects the reality of what happened at the scene. And as far as who you call it prelim, you know, it's also behooves the prosecution to see how witnesses are going to do, to see how well they saw what they claim to have seen, to really allow them to take the stand and relive, like you saw here, exactly what it sounded like, felt like, looked like. That's gonna be powerful evidence for a jury. And preliminary examinations give both sides and the judge an opportunity to see how it's gonna play out and also informs the types of motions in limine, like David was saying about the defendant's statement, what types of motions and limine both sides are going to want to cultivate, craft, write, and bring before trial? One of the things I really appreciate about Court TV is we're able to bring hearings that are at the beginning stages because then you get a better understanding of our entire criminal justice system, and you all are breaking it down so easily. Thank you, Wendy. David, you're going to stay with us. Coming up, is there a serial...